Hello again, everybody, and welcome once again to another edition of Stanley Cup Memories. This is part two of our look back at the 1991 Stanley Cup final, the Penguins and the Minnesota North Stars. We had the thrill of talking to some guys for first two wins uh, of this series, games two and four. Now we're going to look at games five and six, wins three and four. And of course, that magical night on May 25th, 1991, when the Penguins won the Stanley Cup in Bloomington, Minnesota. And our guests are three very important role players on that team. My old partner, Bob Airy, Randy Gillen, and Troy Loney. For Airy and Loney, obviously, it was a very special championship because they had been with the Penguins for a long time and endured a lot of uh, tough years and lean years, but they were there for, uh, for that big moment when the Penguins won the Cup. And Randy Gillen, of course, joined the Penguins uh, in a trade the previous season and uh, during this particular season became an integral part of the Penguins from a role player standpoint as a penalty killer. It certainly did a lot of that during the Stanley Cup final. Great to see you guys. Uh, I, I would assume that with all this time you've had and knowing that we we're going to do this, you've probably been thinking a little bit about uh, that Stanley Cup run and what it was like to play those Minnesota North Stars. What a series that was, right, Troy? I mean, just a really physical and intense series that uh, was really entertaining, I think, for the fans. Well, it sure was for us, and it was our first go around into you know deep in the playoffs. Obviously, at any time in the playoffs, you know, <laughs> other than when we were you know Bobby and I were against the Flyers a few years earlier, but to go that far and 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 the nervousness, I still feel the nervousness of of, of those games, and uh, it was definitely a special time. Randy, uh, for you, um, what was it like to be a part of something like that? Uh, <clears throat> with the Penguins uh, playing such a physical brand of hockey. And also, uh, if you remember the series, if we take a holistic view of it just for a moment here, uh, a, a really a special teams and goaltending series. An incredible amount of power play opportunities uh, and great penalty killing by the Penguins, which you were a part of, obviously. Yeah, well, I think uh, we knew going in playing against Minnesota that they were they were a physical team, and that, but they had dominated their power play earlier uh, in the playoffs against uh, both Edmonton and Chicago, and uh, we knew that special teams was going to have to be a big part of it, and uh, our goaltending was great throughout the series, and our special teams came up huge. Yeah, well, yeah, I, um, you know, like all the same things Randy was talking about. You know, I, I looked through a couple of the games was watching uh, – Randy face off against Bobby Smith in some of those situations, especially when he was killing penalties. And Gilly, you were winning a bunch of face offs on your offside, winning them on the forehand, getting down low on the stick. You know, Gilly was so good, uh, so one of the great penalty killers in the game. And I know Minnesota had tortured the Hawks through the Stanley Cup. And, uh, you know, we had gotten ourselves way too jacked up, I think, in game one and game two, got ourselves in some penalty tro troubles. But you know, with, uh, with the penalty killing, with the goaltending, and and with some timely situations, we were able to claw back into that game. But, uh, boy, Minnesota, they were just watching those games. They were so brutal. I couldn't believe how taxing they were, how they just – how they really butchered our guys on the ice. And uh, the game has certainly changed for the good. You know, Bob, uh, we, when I, you mentioned that, um, and, and I, it occurred to me that, you know, the, the other years that we've seen the Penguins go on long runs and win Stanley Cups, it seems like the most brutal series are usually the early rounds. Often the first round is, is kind of like the way this final series looked, if you know what I mean, because by the time you've played that many games, um, you know, the Penguins were playing, I, I think it was the 104th game of the season the night you won the Cup. Uh, you know, you, it was amazing to me how physical that you guys were able to be with one another, considering how far into the playoffs you actually were. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, I think we knew what was coming. Uh, we knew what their MO was. It was, uh, it was nice at that time to look around you and have guys like Troy, like Kevin Stevens, like old Samuelson, like guys in Gilly, like any of these guys, Brian Trotje, that could give it back. You want to play that game? Eh, we'll beat you at that game, too, and eventually we were able to do that. But uh, as the guys mentioned earlier, your special teams had to be good. And, uh, well, I guess you have to have it all to win the Stanley Cup, and we did at that time. All year long, guys, you had this explosive offense, and uh, it, you demonstrated it throughout this series. But uh, you also, it seemed to me, uh, took a while to kind of figure out how to protect those leads. It was almost like you got them too quickly and – too successfully to the extent that you still had so much hockey to play in these games that it was you know, really difficult to protect them. For instance, in game five, 
uh, after jumping out to a 3 nothing lead in the two, first two minutes and 58 seconds of game four, you know, you had to hang on for a win there. And then in game five, you're off to a 3 nothing lead again, and ultimately a 4 nothing lead. Mario scores on the power play. Uh, and then Kevin Stevens cashed in with the man advantage. So you were two for two on the power play at that point. He, going up to that point, the, the, the Penguins had struggled a bit on the power play. He didn't have the success with the man advantage that we might have expected in the series. But how big was that in game five to get off to a, a good start on home ice and kind of reestablish control of the series, if you will, right from the hop and get a couple of big power play goals to do it? Bobby, you, I know you guys weren't on the power play, but maybe you could just talk about what that was like to see Mario get that big goal and then already right away too. Well, uh, you know, we, we like I said, we had those guys, and there's a lot of trial and tribulation in these in these games, Dave. I don't think we ever felt. I mean, none of us had won Stanley Cups. You, you didn't know exactly what it took. You knew we had some of the, you know, we had the guys in the situation. But uh, as as Troy and Randy can uh, admit to, I don't know if you ever know. For sure, if you have what it takes to win a Stanley Cup. And Randy, uh, another thing that stands out about that start in Game Five is that Mark Recchi, uh scored a couple of goals on the way to that four nothing lead. And if you guys remember, Randy uh, Rex was having some issues getting untracked offensively against them. They were trying to really target him. They were beating him up pretty good throughout the series. And it was great to see him rise up and get a couple of big goals. It was very emotional. Very emotional, and I, I remember that it was uh, they really went after Rex and some of our our skilled guys in that series. I think that definitely that was uh, that was their game plan was to try to throw us off, and uh, Rex eventually battled through that. And uh, you know, going back to what Bob says, I, I couldn't agree more. I think th there's times you just don't really know what it takes, but you just play your best and you play your hardest, and I think we all battled through it. So you get out to a 4 nothing lead on that second goal by Recky. He's kind of off balance, falling, and he, he's able to chip the puck. Uh, and uh, then Brian Hayward's brought in to replace John Casey. So what was that like, Troy, to see that goaltender be chased from the game, considering how much of a factor he'd been in their success? And the Penguins had had a knack, I think, throughout the playoffs, and this went on for a couple of years, of breaking goalies, if you will, over the course of a series. You kind of – really kind of broke through against them. So see that number one goaltender leave the game. What, what were you thinking at that point? Well, I, you know, I think you, you talked about it earlier. Like we were not a, you know, blowing leads wasn't something that was uncommon for that team. We were, <laughs> we were, you know, it was score six and hopefully they score five. It wasn't, wasn't let's win it two, one. That wasn't the first mindset of the team. <laughs> no, no, we could, we could hunker down and play some good solid defense. And, and a lot of guys uh, did that, that maybe hadn't done it during the season consistently, but to ha anytime you can chase the goalie out of the net. And in case he was such an aggressive goalie, right? Way different goalie than Hayward. Hayward's pretty quiet goalie. It wasn't as, as animated or, you know, the poke check that Casey loved to do. So, I think that 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 you know, as a player, when that happens against your team, even though you're help, you you feel pretty good about your goalie that's coming in. You, it, it does kind of mess with your psyche a little bit, and it was definitely good because it did get Rex back on track. We started to get some momentum, and we needed those guys for sure. It was definitely Minnesota's game plan to use Basil McRae and Shane Churla to stir the pot when they fell behind, and they had such confidence in their penalty killing, and they used it for offense. Their penalty killing not only got a momentum, it got them goals. And they got some of their best chances in these games five and six when they were shorthanded. So it's almost like they fixed the issue because they knew that was how they're going to play. There's one point in where I mentioned that Bad, Badger Bob said he couldn't believe um, how much they went on the offense when they were killing penalties. And he said, we have to really defend when we're on the power play and be really aware of that. And it, it made the power play specialists work that much harder going back and forth up and Facing the sort of North Stars around. But then Basil McRae runs Tom Barrasso. And and uh, I'm, I don't know if that's when Tommy got hurt, but I don't know if you remember this. Then he headbutts Kevin Stevens. And uh, do, you, do you remember that sequence and, and what, what uh, resulted from that with McRae running Tom Barrasso when he was out of the net? I, I, I don't remember it. I believe you're staggy. I believe that happened. <laughs> yeah, well, he did. Brasso's out of the net. He's backs to the play, and, and McCray runs him from behind and plows into him. And uh, right after that, there's a 
power play for the Penguins, and Neil Broughton scores a shorthanded goal to make it four to one. But it, it, in that in that scrum, a great headbutts Kevin Stevens, who flips out and you know goes to sucker him, you know, and uh, he doesn't get a penalty for headbutting. We could he could have been thrown out of the game for that, you know. But there's a lot of that kind of crap going on. But that was a big sequence. Because at the end of that period, Barrasso leaves and Frankie comes in, and he replaces Tom Barrasso at the start of the second period. You guys had a lot of faith faith in Frankie, Peter Angelo, and I have to say, he allowed some goals, but he also made a lot of saves the rest of that game. Thus, he made the save earlier in the in the in the playoffs. Right, <laughs> right, in the so New Jersey I mean, series. Right. Yes. But what was your uh, your thoughts there with Frankie coming in? You had a big lead, but did you ever feel like any of these leads were? safe given the fact that you know in the previous game you'd had a big lead too and it, it, you know the game sort of became kind of dicey there you know so what were your thoughts at that point i'm sure randy's got some thoughts on that don't you gilly i mean uh, i don't know if, like like troy mentioned earlier when we wanted to hunker down when everybody wanted to the guys could do it I mean, some of the greatest players but we had some of the greatest offensive talents in the game and these games were you know we didn't mind outscoring teams either we just never knew but we also knew that we relied on every player, and whether it was uh, Frankie Pierangelo, Jimmy Pack, guys all the way down through the lineup. We were as excited. We depended on those guys, and we couldn't have won a Stanley Cup with each and every, without each and every one of those guys. There's no question, Bob. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I never worried once about who our goalie was going to be, whether it would be Wendell or Frankie or – or or Tom. And, and I just uh, – <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I never worried once about uh, who was going to play, what we were going to do. Uh, all I know is I just looked at our top six or our top nine guys, and I knew that they would outplay the other team's top six or top na- nine. And uh, we might win 6-5, but uh, we also had some role guys that played good defense and killed penalties and, and did the job. You know, and you, had, you were in a, in a tough spot there when, when they started to come back in this game. Um, Alf Dahlen scored to make it 5-3. to three. Uh, and so now all of a sudden, what you know, the North Stars have some life, they're down by a couple, and you know, it's, it's still a long way to go in this game. A couple of things I wanted to bring up just to kind of get stir your memory here a little bit about some guys. Uh, first of all, you had two backup goaltenders in the game at this point you had Hayward and Peter Angel, so neither of the starting goalies was in a game. Brian Bellows had not scored a goal in the series. He was their top scorer. And I had Alfie on the previous two games, and he was very proud of the fact that Bellows never scored. He's, he took it per, like almost like a personal mission to keep that guy off the score sheet. And it was pretty obvious that he was doing that. What do you remember about that, about just the, the way the, the guys that you were zeroing in on? Who were on their team were guys that you felt you had to do certain things against to keep them from scoring? Do you remember? The Gagne was one guy I know you had a, some, a little bit of a game plan for, but they, there were some dangerous guys on that team. Well, if I remember right, they had pretty balanced scoring, too. They, 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 even though they had some, some, some guys they did depend on, I thought they, they spread their scoring pretty good amongst that team. And, I mean, I was, I was mostly playing that year in the playoffs with uh, Yager and Trache. So, I mean, for the first time in probably my whole career, I wasn't really counted on to be in that defensively. Uh, well, at those two I was, but. But overall, it was a little bit more more of an opportunity to play uh, offense. But they were they were big and physical. I mean, I think our, our, our biggest challenge was trying to stay smart in that environment. Paul was, was just not taking uh, you know uh, stupid penalties. Although you know I took one, and thanks to these guys, killed it off, which was really crucial. I think it was in Game Four when we were in uh, Minnesota. But um, they were a good balance. I, I remember them as a good balance, strong, heavy team. Yeah, and I remember them having a lot of power plays early in the game, Randy. And you you got a chance to, to uh, you know to do your thing out there. So uh, talk about your strategy as uh, you know penalty killers. And what's it like for you, Gilly, to be having to sit for you know pretty long stretches, and then all of a sudden you're put out there in really key situations. It seems like something you uh, you thrived on. Yeah, honestly, it, it never bothered me. Obviously, you'd like to play lots and be fresh when you go out there. But, uh, you know, I, I took a lot of pride in that. And, uh, you know, I killed with Bob a lot throughout the year. And, uh, you know, I, we really enjoyed killing penalties together. So um, I, I think their strategy, I think uh, if you remember, they had a young Mike Medano at that time, too, who could really hit it. 
And I can remember they were they would try to feed him at the point a lot, and we tried to take him away, but they did. As Troy said, they had balanced scoring, but when they put the when they put their power play there, they had uh, they had some guys Gagne, Bobby Smith. They had some players that could uh, could score some goals, but I I specifically remember Mike Medano. He could really hit it. I remember Mark Tenorti being a force. And if you could, uh, Troy, just talk about what Tenorti was doing for them in that series and how much of a force he was defensively, physically, offensively, everything. Well, I played junior with, with Mark, so I, I knew his game. Big, tall, lanky guy, played pretty heavy, decent skills, right? Not, 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 a, not, a, not a great skater. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, not a great skater, but he was, he was a physical guy. He did, they did lean on him quite a bit. They, 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 they gave him the puck quite often, but he was big. He was physical and he could play mean for him. So I would say of their, of all their defensemen, he was the one guy and he was just starting to come into his own end too. Uh, of all the guys, he was the one guy back on D. I think they counted on the most. When, um, when the score was, I'm going back a, a little bit now, when the score was uh, four, two, it would have been five, two. Mario got a breakaway. I don't remember this. It was shorthanded. He had a breakaway and, uh, Hayward made a glove save on him. If he scores there, it's 5-2, and I'm not saying the game would have been over because it, it, it doesn't seem like games were ever going to be that easy for you guys earlier in the series. But uh, you went out, Troy, with Ron Francis, and uh, it was um, – Stu Gavin hit the crossbar, and I have a – thing I wrote down, there's one shift where Bob Airy and Troy Loney are on the same shift with Brian Trache, and I'm thinking, Troy, you must have been playing right wing, because Bobby said he hated playing the right wing, he only liked to play the left side. Uh, Do you remember I, taking I, some shifts with, with, with your buddy Bobby and Trotz? I would say Bob jumped the gun. The Yager come <laughs> off on the right side, Bob said, I'll go, and he just took off. I think that's what ended up happening, because that's really? the only way <laughs> we ended up up there together. Uh, but, but we all played, I mean, you know, I remember it was in that playoff year, wasn't it, Randy? That you uh, you jumped on. No one came off, right? Someone <laughs> came off. No one went on, and you jumped out, scored a big goal on the back end that year. So, hey, right? yeah, that, that's the time Badger Bob said, "Great goal, don't ever do that again." That was <laughs> that was the best. I remember that like I was sitting right beside you, Gilly. That was unbelievable. I don't know how you were, you knew to do that, but you just hopped on. And maybe. Just want to get your legs uh, going. <laughs> jumped on, and Gilly jumps on and scores. Honestly, I don't know. If, I don't know if you were happier or the rest of the team was happier. I, I can tell you, Gilly was such a big part of the team, and he knew his role to a T. And he he never missed a trick. And that was, uh, I tell you, that was unbelievable, Gilly. And that was a huge goal for us too. Yeah, I remember that. That was against Washington. That was fun. Yeah, that was really cool. That, that's those are the moments you remember. The ones you know on the way to the final, the little, well, big deals. You know, things that uh, you know look back on the whole run. If they if they don't happen, you never get to where you are. By the time you're in Minnesota for Game Five, or at home in Pittsburgh for Game Five, there's one shift where Yarmir Yager is protecting the puck, and he's he, it's like a glimpse of how great he's going to end up being in his career. He's only 19 years old. He's got Brian Glenn all over him. He's air hugging him. He's hanging on to him. And Yager's protecting the puck down low. No penalty on the play. But I just wanted to get your thoughts on what you saw in Yarmir Yager because he was finally beginning to actually be able to speak a little bit of English. But this was a kid who had come a long way in a really short period of time. And, Bobby, you were playing with him. You were playing a lot. You were playing left wing with Trotz, and he was playing the right wing. Yeah, we were switching yeah. out a lot, our lines, Troy and I, like, had happened uh, for the first nine, 10 years of our career. We were just, you know, going from this line to this line, depending on the situation or the score. And, uh, you know, I remember playing with Yager in a lot of those situations. I think he just tried to, as Troy knows, uh, just tried to interfere for him. Just tried to um, give him a little space if you could. You, you'd go to the net, you do what you have to do, and uh, get the hands, uh, get the puck in the hands of Trotz and Yager when you could, and, and just, uh, Clear space, like I said, clear space, go to the net, maybe try to bang in a rebound. There wasn't a lot of difference uh, in our games. Uh, I think we were able to, that's why we were able to be so interchangeable, uh, both Troy and I. And, um, you know, Yager was a guy that had that big toe curve. He was able to control the puck like a lot of these these guys, uh, these European guys could. Um, he had a, the biggest backside, Troy. Eh? I mean, it was huge. It was just... Uh, uh, maybe Kevin Stevens was bigger. I don't know, but uh, continue. <laughs> but 
But I mean, Yager was one of the greatest one-on-one players to ever play the game, ever. Maybe Peter Forsberg and Mario Lemieux and Yager. Yeah, Gilly, do you remember um, what a factor he was? Because obviously we talk a lot about the great skill players, but he was playing on a third line, Yara Mary Yager. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying, Staggy. Like I, when, when I look back at it right now, I, I was never worried because it wasn't – some teams rely on their top three or their top six. Our top nine were amazing. Just uh, could play against anybody, and I think we had the confidence that they would beat anybody. But, you know, I think Bob said it right. Uh, the one thing with the Augs is he, he just got better as the year went on and really started to come into his own in that playoff. And, uh, you know, the one thing I remember about him that year is he, he never missed an optional or a day off. He really liked to play, and he really had fun playing. And, and uh as Bob said, the big backside, he put it out there, and uh, he was a hard guy to control. I was watching the uh, Sportsnet telecast of this, and they were telling a story, Bob, about your dad, Don Airy, the Don of Peterborough. I guess he was superstitious, and because the games he had been at, he didn't win. He didn't want to come to that game five. And then something happened. Uh, the weather was bad or something up in Peterborough, so – he and the family decided on second thought to go down there and watch game five. Do you remember that? Yeah. Somebody else asked me about that. And I, I don't remember him, be, him being superstitious. I don't stay. I know he came down for the game. Uh, they stayed and watched game six in Pittsburgh. And then, uh, and after that, tried to go to the, the airport. We're able to, unable to get to the airport at that time to meet us with all the traffic. But uh, yeah, I, I couldn't remember him being so superstitious like that. I was wondering where exactly where that story came from. And, now you've uh, you piqued my interest here. I got to revisit that to make sure and to see if that was the case. But um, it's quite possible they were. I have no idea. But uh, Bill Clement, Bill Clement told the story. Did they did they come down in, a, in an RV or something, or uh, what did they do? Did they travel down as a? No, we uh, had a Plymouth Ferrari. Does that count? <laughs> they had the wood paneling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know how those color commentators are, Staggy? They, they just say anything. I know. They make stuff up. I know. I, I know. Not me. But, uh, everybody else did. Okay. So uh, let's get to the to the big goal that uh, that comes uh, late in the game. Uh, it's uh, dicey now. It's a 5-4 it's a, it's a game. It's a one-goal game. It's kind of scary because you had a big lead in the game, and all of a sudden you're hanging on, and uh, here comes Troy Loney driving to the net. Tell, tell me uh, what happened on the play, Troy. How do you remember the whole thing unfolding? Well, I remember being on the bench and and Bob looking down the bench. Bob Johnson looked down the bench and going, we need a goal. And then he looked at me and went, you're up. <laughs> Come on, really? <laughs> oh, are you sure Mario wasn't behind you, Troy? <laughs> Maybe that's what I saw. I might have did, did a Randy Gillen and just jumped. That's right. Uh, that me. You should have uh, taken no. it in your own hands. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that I remember I was coming up the I ended up on the right hand side, I think, and Murph ended up with the puck somehow. So it was kind of like a two on one. Uh and, and Murph, I knew well enough to know I wasn't getting the puck. He was he was gonna shoot the puck. So he shoots the puck at the net, and I can't remember the defenseman for the for the North Stars, but I just went he kind of blocked me from the net and I just went into the net. And somehow the puck went in. I think if they show replays now, it doesn't look like I ever touched it, but my name is on the score sheet, right, Staggy? <laughs> Darn right it is. You got a, you got a big a deal. Skate lace. You hit your skate lace. I yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Stuck to the Velcro. I remember you saying you got out of there as quickly as you could. You just wanted to hurry up and get out of that goal crease in case they were – because Brian Hayward went crazy. He immediately yeah. thought there's no way that should have been a goal. And today, can you imagine we'd still be reviewing it, like today. We'd be still looking at it. Yeah. Decide whether or not it's a goal because they would. There's no. I'm, I'm not sure they would have allowed it uh, with uh, the replays. I, I would have been in the penalty box for sure. <laughs> uh, that was a big deal. So, what's interesting is to me is Badger was asked in an interview during the they, they played it during the game because the Penguins had had issues protecting these leads. So they asked him, "What do you have to do to play with a lead? How, how can you be better at that?" And he said, "Well, when you play with a lead, you you got to make offense, you know, defensive decisions, and you got to make sure you know you get the puck, keep it going ahead of you, and you, you got to get your defensive players on the ice." He said, "So I, I'm quite sure that he turned to you guys 
uh, a lot when the when the when the score was up because he was trying to think how are we going to keep them from scoring. And don't you think, Troy, that he called upon you in those situations late in games when you were trying to protect leads? You know, the, 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 and, and I've said this before about Bob, the, the thing I like so much about him is he really defined your role for you. He would say to you, hey, this, this is your role. When this happens, you're going to be out there. And he was true. You know, some coaches will say that, and then they kind of look and go, eh, maybe not, you know. But he was true to that all the time. And I remember, distinctly remember, you know, Kevin Stevens being pulled off the ice sometimes and I would go out for him. And Kevin, just the way Kevin was, just big bark of the whole way. I can't play defense, you know. And, and they all knew, no, you can't. But when no, we yeah. know, we're not going to percent or put you out there. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's the way I, I, you know, Bob was so good that way. I think that's why players love playing for him because you knew exactly what he wanted of you. And you always tried to do more, but you at least had to do that because that's what he really counted on. There's another sequence uh, here where Bob is uh, – and it's a five on three. It's not going particularly well. And he calls a timeout. Uh, and he's got the all his power play guys around. And I think Bobby, you and Randy are sitting next to each other, kind of like not far that far away. I don't know if you could hear what he was telling him, but I, I thought I'd ask you a little bit more about Badger Bob. What kind of things was he saying to you guys like during the series, like in in between periods? And was he was he did he talk a lot in those situations? Because nowadays you have uh, in the room and these shows where we see all this access, you get to see the coaches talking to their team and everything. That was completely unallowed back then. That was that the locker room was a sacred place. You know, no one knew what went on in that room other than the players and the coaches who were in there, the trainers. So what would be, I'd just be interested if you take us inside there a little bit and uh, maybe tell us what Badger Bob was, was saying in, uh, before games and during uh, the games between periods. Well, I think the the one thing that stands out for me with Badger was uh, everything was positive. He uh, he would uh, there wasn't a negative part to him ever, I, and it goes back to the regular season. I remember the very first time he went back to Calgary to coach, and uh, we got blown out in Calgary, just absolutely pounded. It was the first time I've ever seen a three on old breakaway for uh, a team have against us, and they didn't score. They didn't know what to do. Um, but he came, he came in after that game and I'll never forget it. He was so frustrated, but, uh, he just looked at us all and just said, you know, when you, when you make a double bogey or a triple bogey, you go to the practice range and he turned around, he walked out and that was, his, that was the way he was. He was always just positive. There was no yelling or screaming. And, uh, I, I can just remember throughout that whole playoff series, him just trying to reinforce the belief that. We were better. We were a better team, and, and we would win. Yeah, I mean, he just he made you feel good to come to the rink because he always knew he was on your side. Like Troy said, he knew at the end of the game, you know, if he talked to you before the game, he'd stick to his game plan. You'd, you'd get a chance to go out there and seal the deal if that was your role. I remember in the training camp, it probably was the second day of training camp, and Randy Gillen is skating around center ice. Randy will remember it. He said, you got to get another <laughs> – we got to get another step out of you, Gilly. One more step. One more step. One more step. And he's going around the center. And every, Randy would have that big smile on his face, and he'd wind it up, and he'd try to get that one more step as he bolted across that red line, board to board. It was credible. And we'd all get laugh and smile and giggle. And uh, But he was like that. He cared as much about your family and your dog or what you did last night or what movie you watched as he did about hockey. And he kind of. It was a it was a more personal side to him. He was great to be around, and he uh, he really made you feel like he appreciated uh, he was a whole, not just your game of hockey. I remember Craig Patrick saying Troy that uh, he wanted a father figure, and they mentioned in, in the uh, in the game they go, "There's Bob Johnson. He is a father of five, and he has nine grandchildren." And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, now that I'm you know even older than he was at that time, and I have a couple grandkids, I mean, I could kind of appreciate. Uh, the difference in a, in a kind of person that he was from usual guys that you would have coaching you. So Craig was, he decided to bring in a father figure and did he have that quality about him in, in your opinion? Yeah, I would say so for sure. I mean, and it was our first time, you know, I mean, Bob and I were probably on coach number seven or eight by then. Uh, in our <laughs> Not our fault. It was, it was us. Um, <laughs> but it was it was it was such a change because the, the the positiveness of him was always like you you wanted to you always wanted to do more right you always wanted to do more and he had a great way of getting you focused and then getting you completely unfocused from hockey so he was the first coach that said hey you need to take a day off 
just just take a day off. And 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 coaches before it, you could fly eight hours, bus four, and you were practicing that day. And he was the first guy that had in that wave of I would say new new coaches because he really was a teacher at heart. He really was a teacher on how to teach and think differently about the game, and it made it made for a, a relaxed feeling but but also he could be he could help us to be very focused at the right time he had that goal. okay troy so you score the uh, the goal the penguins win the game uh they do it with frankie peter angelo in the net for two periods i thought he did a really good job maybe uh doesn't get a lot of notoriety for what he did in that game in my opinion uh there were a lot of saves he had to make because it, it didn't matter what the score was in that game they were going to be scoring chances and you better you better get saves and he was able to do that so now Tom Barrasso is feeling better for game six. And as it turns out, we find out, I found out, that he could have played, uh, continued playing in game five, but they didn't want to risk further injury. And they were concerned, I think, a little bit that the North Stars were going to try to take him off, try to run him and try to get him out of the game. So we go into game six. He's wearing bike pants underneath his, uh, his hockey pants uh, for support for his groin. He's wearing these tight bike pants. He gets in the net, and on the first shift – Somebody runs him. And uh, do you remember that? And there was, I don't think there was any question at the beginning of game six what the North Stars were trying to do. Was it, was it Broughton who ran? Broughton. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly who it was. I do. I, I, I did. That's just what I remember. And, um, well, the North Stars had a game plan, and that was to hack and whack from day one. Like Troy said, just go after the Stars, or maybe it was Randy who said it. And, uh, you know, uh, they wanted to try to knock those guys off their game. And they knew they had to win game six. Uh, they, came, they came in with that game plan that got them through the playoffs. And I guess it wasn't going to work because at that point, uh, we had one thing in mind and, uh, you know, stuck to it steadfast. Uh, I don't think there was anybody going to beat that team that game, was there? I mean, there's no chance. We, did, we were just uh, – we had gone through enough up and downs, and Troy had been long enough for you and I, and uh, let's get it done tonight. I think everybody had it in their focus to get it done. And Yeah, it would have been nice to win in Pittsburgh, but we weren't going to take that chance. We were going to get it done there in Minnesota. Well, what was it like in the, in the room before the game, Randy? I, I have heard that you guys, have, there was a certain level of intensity, or like Bob said, focus. There was a feeling. There was just a feeling before that game that you guys were not going to be beaten. I couldn't agree more. There was a focus that game that I'd, I mean, we, we were a pretty, uh, I'd say a relaxed bunch in the locker room. We like to have fun and we like to joke around. That was always, uh, that was always going to happen, but there was a certain focus before that, that I'll never forget. And, uh, I, I mean, it was said several times among uh, the guys that, uh, there was just no way we were going to lose that game. We knew it. We had a feeling and, uh, for them to go out and take a penalty right away and for us to score, I think that set the whole tempo for the game. Yeah, and on the power play, what's interesting eight. about it is we get towards the end of the power play and Badger Bob puts a more defensive posture on the ice for the last 19, 15 seconds of that power play. He had Trotz out there. He had Bobby out there. He had Alf Samuelson on the ice. And Alfie shoots the puck from the point. And what happened after that, Bob? Somehow it went in. I don't know how it did, but uh, Casey whiffed it, and there you go. We're on the board, Olfi. And who knew that would be the game winner? I know that you were in front of the net, and there were some, we were talk, commenting that it looked like somebody might have touched it on the way in, but um, do you well, feel like it might on it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't that. I never touched anything. I had the widest blade in the league, but could never touch the darn puck. That was a big deal, though, getting that first goal and under the circumstances. You know, and I was mentioning earlier the power play for the Penguins going into this game. The Penguins' power play was four for thirty-two. Do you believe that? It's all what? And you guys were able to get an early power play goal from Alf Samuelson of all people in a huge game that you where you wanted to get off to a good start. So, uh, describe the feeling of seeing Alfie score and that and that getting that early goal like that. After they had obviously tried to use their tactics, and they've been successful too, you know, taking, as I said earlier, putting themselves, believe it or not, in a situation where they were generating sometimes their best chances when they were shorthanded. I thought it was great. I mean, you know, you know, and Jimmy Pack scores a goal in that game. I mean, it wasn't, you know, the guys that were supposed to score scored, but we got goals from, I think Bob mentioned it earlier, that whenever we needed something, somebody found a way to do it. And it didn't matter who it was, when it was, big block shot, 
a goal from someone not maybe not expecting to get a goal. Um, you know, but Ulfie had been Ulfie's such a fierce competitor. I mean, he just always just he's always competitive right from the very beginning. And everything he does, even mess around in the locker room before the games. So uh to see him get it and to fire up the troops. And then after that, like like I agree with these guys. In the morning we were a little nervous in the morning ski. We never got nervous as a group. It was it was very unusual. And I remember saying to Joey Mullen, you feel it? He goes, oh, yeah, we are going to smoke them tonight. And, <laughs> and, 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 we just, and we just did. You could, you could just feel it was going to happen. Well, Joey scored. Mario scored a short a goal to make it two to nothing. Then Joe Mullen scores to make it three to nothing from Kevin Stevens and Peter Tagnanetti. So you had a power play goal, a short a goal, and then you got the even strength goal. And then um, I see Bobby blocking a couple of sonority shots on a penalty kill. And the Stars are now three for 33 in the series, you know, on the power play. And uh, um, the fourth power play opportunity of the first period for the Stars. And, Randy, you are uh, getting an opportunity to kill some penalties here in this game. Now, you know, everybody thinks of this game as being this big blowout. But the fact of the matter is they had four power play chances in the first period. So you guys were getting the job done. Yeah, I think our special teams, our penalty killing throughout that whole series was excellent. And a uh, big reason why we, why we won that. And that first period, I remember in many there, they had some opportunities and we were able to shut them down. And uh, it's a good feeling when you have that, when you, you know, our power play ended up scoring, as you said, which is uh, always nice when your power play can score and then you turn right back around, you can kill off a couple of their penalties. So good feeling and, and uh, great to feel part of it when that's happening. We talked, Bob, about how you guys turned the tables on them as far as their power play. It had been unreal throughout the playoffs until that series when your penalty killing did such a great job. Another thing that they were doing really well through the playoffs was scoring in the first period. They were outscoring their opposition. But after this period, uh, it's 3 nothing after one period. The Penguins had outscored the Minnesota North Stars 13-4 to in the first periods of these games in this series. And I think there was something that kicked in here in game six finally. What was it? that changed so that you didn't get yourself in that same position you'd been in in the previous two games where you also had big leads, but they somehow were able to chip away at them. What was the difference? Well, it was a close up game, right? I mean, uh, I don't, you know, you got to learn from your, from your mistakes in the previous ones. And I think like the guy said earlier, the, our focus was different in this hockey game. So even at three, nothing, the talk would have been, Let's uh, keep the pedal uh, to the metal. Hey, keep the foot on the pedal here. Uh, let's not let, allow them to get back in the game. Let's fight to try to get the next goal. Let's uh, let's take it to them. Um, yeah, there was, there was a commitment to, to a 200-foot hockey game, and we weren't going to let this one slip away, not even get close. Uh, it was too much. Uh, that was what something we had fought for, we had dreamt of all our lives to win a Stanley Cup stay. It was in the building. The Cup was in the building. And... Uh, it was 3 nothing. We weren't going to let them get into the game. They were coming after Paul Coffey. He was wearing a face protector for a, bro for a broken jaw. Uh, they were trying to uh, target him a little bit. What do you remember, uh, Randy, about uh, what Coff was going through? Because he'd come to the bench and he'd take his helmet off. There's a lot of shots of him on the bench with no helmet because he, he was probably driving him nuts wearing that thing. You know, what do you remember how he was dealing with the fact that he was really only getting a chance to play on the power play? Yeah, Kopp, uh, I think Kopp had a hard time with that at the start, but he was, he wanted to play more, but uh, as you said, uh, he was limited to just playing the power play. And, uh, you know, for a guy that's used to playing so much and, uh, you know, Kopp's legs were what uh, what carried him. I think everybody would agree with that. And he uh, he did a great job through that, but they went they went after him and they went after him hard. Uh, you know, those, those were the days where, uh, you know, guys would take liberties at them and especially in uh, – especially in the playoffs back in those days, it was almost no, no, no autopsy, no foul. So it was, uh, it was, it was tough on cough, I think, but he battled through it and did a great job for us. And you talked about the next goal, Bob, you got it. You got, you made it for nothing. Um, you remember the goal? I do. Just, uh, one of those, like, uh, like Troy scored in the previous game, just drive the net, just, uh, take the puck in with you. You know what I mean? If you, Hey, they don't ask how. They ask how many, right? And uh, you just—that's how we—that's how we, you know, we knew our game, and uh, we knew our limitations. And I knew what I had to do. Just went to the net, and luckily the puck went there and found me. 
Well, Yarmir Yager got you the puck. He came out from behind the net, and he just dished it right into the goal crease, and you were on your butt when you scored it. You reached out with your stick and got the piece of blade on it and pushed it over the goal line. So now it's 4 nothing. That's a big deal because it came on the heels again uh, of another situation where the Penguins – gotten a power play and they've gotten some great opportunities again shorthand bureau had a great chance on like a focus my breakaway and uh and then you ended up getting that goal to make it four to nothing then ron francis scores on a breakaway to make it five nothing set up by joey mullen and uh you know you guys are off and really running now so now what are you talking about on the bench what kind of things are you saying at this point when under most circumstances, it's 5 nothing. You figure you got the game wrapped up. But knowing what the North Stars have done in the previous games in the series, what are you guys telling each other at that point? Yeah, like, what, what are you telling me, guys? What were you saying? <laughs> I, don't remember, I don't remember us, uh, uh, like, ever feeling like, you know, that the game was – we had to really batten down or we weren't going to win. I mean, I just, we just were in that role. Like, it was just like, you know, you hear people say everything slows down. I mean, definitely when you're up 5-0 and it's the game that you could – Clinch for the Stanley Cup. The clock was moving very slowly. I do remember that, but I, I don't think we ever felt uh, that. You know, I I always with that team looking back. You know, I always had the mindset: if they score four, we score five. If they score five, we score six. And we were in a little different realm that game. We were clicking, and they just kept being stupid. And they just couldn't help themselves that game. And the better we got, the more stupid they got. Yeah, I could feel that. And and uh, Joey Mullen scores on a breakaway to make it six to nothing. And Mike Lang says in the broadcast, they need six to tie. <laughs> <laughs> and he he wasn't saying that jokingly. He was saying, because I, I think he really genuinely didn't want to concede. He didn't say all of us left the building till the game was over. Uh, believe it or not, an eight nothing hockey game. Jim Pack scored to make it seven to nothing. Uh, Don Casey goes back into the game. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's it's amazing to me just uh, how much fun it was at that point. We we're showing shots of the wives in the stands. Uh, the celebration, in a way, had already begun. A lot of the fans left in Minnesota. Not all of them. Some of them stayed and gave their team a standing ovation. But what a scene that must have been. What a feeling that must have been on the bench, guys, when you felt that that moment coming. Like like in the, when you're getting closer to that countdown. Uh, do you, when you reflect on it now, do you, do you remember the giddiness of it all? And just, you know, what, what were you feeling, Bobby, at that point? Well, I don't know. I was, I was so happy to get back on the bench. I just wanted to get the red line, dump it in, and go celebrate with my teammates. Because at 6 nothing in the dressing room, I didn't feel like we had anything wrapped up because it had been so long and things had not been that successful in, in our careers. So, you know... Um, and this is for the Stanley Cup. But when it was 7 nothing, and I was on the bench, I really actually wanted to stay on the bench and celebrate and be giddy with the teams. And the guy that was the giddiest, you guys have to admit, I think, was was Brian Trotchier. Yeah. He's like the biggest kid. He's already won Stanley Cups. And he was like he's never won before. And he's like rubbing everybody's head and giggling. And he was like the biggest kid on the bench, guys. Why do you think that was? I think it had a lot to do with the fact that maybe he was, when he was in the middle of those four cups with the Islanders, he, he probably, after all those years, really looked back on it and thought, man, what a great feeling that was. I want to feel it again. I noticed Randy, and I don't know if he, if he exuded this you know, to you guys, but in watching him on the telecast, he's so calm all the time. He has this look on his face like he's just playing a game in the you know, second week in November. And it's, you know, it's the Stanley Cup final. He's taking these draws, and, he, and, and he's just so stoic in a way. Uh, when he's on the ice, yeah, I just I, I got a real kick out of that. Well, what what do you think that experience meant to you guys? Well, it, it's funny because we talked about it a little bit earlier. Troy alluded to it that uh, we really didn't know what to expect. We hadn't been through this, uh, and certainly I hadn't been through it either. But I think we relied on Trotz a lot and Joey Mullen and Cough, the guys that had been there. But uh, Trotz was the guy. I, I think if people remember, he kind of you know. Uh, he, he was done in the island, and uh, this was almost like a second opportunity to come to, to Pittsburgh for him when he signed there. And and uh, he, his experience was just invaluable, how good he was, and he was so relaxed. And And I remember what Bob said on the bench. He was so excited, and it was just like, this is what I came to Pittsburgh for, but none of us really knew, you know, what was going on or, or how to react. It was just the – I just remember the third period being the longest period of my life. It was just – it was like it was <laughs> – 
Yeah, guys giving each other grief and going offside, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. A four-point night for Mario when Murphy backhands one in from the slot. You guys go three for five on the power play. You scored as many goals in that game as you had scored in the series uh, prior to that game. Uh, and you just blow the doors off off the North Stars. And Mario was unbelievably dialed in in that game. I mean, if you guys have a chance to just go back and watch it again sometime, just take, take a look and just – it's like everything he did in that game was just – Beautiful to watch. It was really something. And, you know, we talk about trots, we, but the big boy was uh, was really was really going, and he, and he he could smell it. You could tell he could he could smell it that night. Yeah, he was okay. <laughs> <laughs> we we needed it. He was the guy. I mean, he was always. You knew what you were going to get out of him all the time. So you know, I, and I, and I say that kind of half you know tongue in cheek, but um, you know, he did so many great things throughout the time that that, that we played with him. That he just, just of course he did. Like, why wouldn't he? He's Mario, right? I mean, exactly. You know, and yeah. he wanted it. He definitely wanted it. And definitely. sometimes not, not in full health, like hurting badly doing yeah. those things. And I remember that, you know, like when Troy, Troy mentioned, we talked about when he had that five minute, uh, five minute penalty with gate four, I guess it was, but even yeah. in a situation. Mario was the best penalty killer in the league. Randy, do you not admit if he wanted to be, there was a guy you wanted on the ice and you had three against your five. There was one guy you would pick in the league. You would pick Mario, wouldn't you? No, oh, for sure. He had that reach and the instinct. And, you know, guys, they weren't taking chances when he was killing a penalty because there was always that threat that he could take it the other way. And in game six, he did take it the other way. He did. As a matter of fact, we mentioned that earlier, the, the shorthanded goal that he scored early in the game, that came right after he had made a ridiculous play where he anticipated that the puck was going to go to uh, Broughton, I believe it was. And uh, so he broke up the play and then he was able, then Murphy set him up for the shorthanded goals. He banked one out to him and in center ice, he just went in. Another thing I wanted to ask you guys about, just a general thing, about watching this series, how much speed was generated through the neutral zone? And what I think is really interesting is you had a red line, like there, this after two thousand the, the lockout in in oh uh, four oh five the league took out the red line and yet if you watched this game you would you would think there was no red line just the way that you you guys could get speed going through the neutral zone there was nobody clogging it up you know what I mean it wasn't trapping hockey maybe there were teams that were doing it but it certainly wasn't happening in this series it was a completely different brand of hockey that. Where, where so much speed was generated all the time. And I would think that from a, for guys who were paid to play defense, that had to be really tough because you weren't playing a system necessarily that made it that easy for you guys to be able to dial into that part of your game, if you know what I mean. Like the guys were saying earlier, you know, we, we outscored a lot of teams with a lot of talent. I mean, uh, I mean they had Stu Gavin, Gaytown, Duchesne, guys like that. They were great defensive hockey players that were known for that. Uh, you know, they could play defense and they had they had one with defense and and their power play was great in the playoffs in North Stars. But you know, look at our team, look at our right look at our right wingers. I mean, you know, come on, Joey Mullen, Mark Recky, Jeremy Yager. Come on, what are you talking? We got all the Hall of Famers. I mean, how are you gonna stop that kind of speed? And uh, you know, look look at our centermen. How are you gonna stop that? Um, it's quite difficult. Uh, it was too difficult for them. Uh, I guess they could have played a one-two-two, but they just wanted to, you know, they just wanted to whack and hack a little too much. We, we just had too much. We had too much. The team was, uh, the team was too powerful. And like Gilly said, uh, you know, as deep as you want, we were as deep as any team in the league, and we had a lot of uh, not only speed and talent, but a lot of trial and tribulation. We had guys we relied on that had won cups, guys that hadn't won cups. That was a perfect. We had to coach all those guys together. I just think. Uh, that was a team of destiny for sure. Okay, guys, uh, we're going to wrap this up, but I want to I want to get to the celebration. Uh, I was in the locker room waiting for you guys to come in the room. You were still out on the ice uh, skating around with the cup, and I was in the locker room. Edward J. DeBartolo was in there when I walked in, the owner of the team. I waited for you guys to come in. I was on a podium to do the interviews, and Badger came in, and you were all in there, and he had the hat, the championship hat. And he goes, put it on, and he goes like this. I don't know if you remember that. It was awesome. But, uh, man, was he a happy guy. And just that feeling in the, in, the, in the room when you all went in there with the cup. What a night. What a night that was. Starting then and going right on through the plane ride. And Gilly's going, Gwyn's win! Gwyn's win! What's your favorite uh, phrase, Gilly? 
was great stuff. It was magical time, unbelievable. It was. Uh, I have to. I have to say this. Uh, we we talked about this before, but uh, I remember Barry Peterson saying to me one time. Um, we were out for lunch, and he he said it was in the playoffs, and he said, you know, he said this is the best group of guys I ever played with. He said we could have not have even made the playoffs this year, and I've never had so much fun. Now, winning and fun go hand in hand, but uh, just a great group of guys we had, and uh, those memories, I'll, I'll never forget those memories. Remember that plane ride, Gilly? You guys are in the back of the plane. You got the cup. You're tilt, you're tilting it and uh, having a great time. People are coming back and taking drinks out of it. Uh, it was, and they didn't have a chaperone for the cup back then, so you guys were your own chaperones. It was fabulous. Yeah, it was a great plane ride home, and then uh, to land in Pittsburgh and see see what was waiting for us in Pittsburgh was uh, a little overwhelming. And uh, I'll never forget getting on the buses that they had for us there. And Badger Bob was tired, and he sat down and yelling at him, "Hey, Badger, wake up!" And he just looked up and he just went eight nothing and put his head back. <laughs> <laughs> Troy, what do you remember about that uh, that feeling coming back to Pittsburgh and into the airport? I remember walking out, you know, I remember the, as we're getting closer, the, the, the captain, no, there's a thousand people, there's five thousand people, there's a thousand people at the airport. And we're like, what? what do you mean? And you know, get coming off that one, you know, those gates, anyone, anyone and their dog could get to any gate, any time in the airport, coming out and just that whole crowd. And everyone just pushing. I distinctly remember everyone just pushing in and, and kind of going to the beginning. Like, ah, and then after a while, I was like, wow, there's a lot of people here. It was, uh, you know, and, and, and to have been around the Penguin organization for so many years, Staggy, as you would know, and Bob, and, and to not have that success and the city just totally be enthralled with the success the team had and to be part of that, that was, that was a special time. Badger Bob said, these guys will remember it. Uh, they'll, be, they'll appreciate it more 30 years from now. It, well, it's not, it hasn't been 30 years, Staggy. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it was incredible, Staggy. We didn't even know where to go. We got on the buses in the park a lot. It's about 2,000 degrees out. And then we're like, where are we going now? I remember taking taking the bus somewhere. I think we went to Brasso's house. And then we sat on the curb for a while. Then we went here, went with there. And we looked at each other and said, eventually, I think we said, uh, let's just continue this in a couple hours. Went home and grabbed about three hours sleep and then uh, threw it in Mario's pool the next day. Right, Gilly? Got all the pictures to prove it. <laughs> uh, I just remember getting off that plane, coming in the airport, and all those people, and there were six security guards, and they all jumped around Mario, and the rest of us had to find for ourselves. <laughs> Did Borky, is Borky the one who threw the cup in Mario's pool? Yes. I remember it. Do you, do you, can you still see that happening? Can you? I remember him. I, for some reason, I thought he might have been in his underwear in my mind too. So, which wouldn't <laughs> surprise me. Actually, might might be surprised he had underwear on. But he was, uh, <laughs> I remember him throwing it in. I do remember swimming. I remember Trotz was part of it. I was part of it. swimming down to the bottom and pulling that thing up because it had that false bottom on. That sucker was heavy to get out of there. And then I it got. That. Then it was then, all rusted for the. Uh, was it all rusted for the next day at the park, Troy? Well, the, the top was broke, right? Yeah, the we top? had some bubble gum on the top to hold the top pole on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you lifted it, you kind of cradled it. You know, you didn't go like that, like and hold it on the ends. You kind of had to cup the cup with your hand, and you watch the video. You can see you guys babying the thing as you lifted it up on the stage uh, at the parade so except for uh, those days will never happen again except for Caulfield he grabbed it like that and I remember everyone going whoa <laughs> I want to throw one more thing out here and it's just I joked about at the end of the at the end of the telecast there's a shot of all the guys uh the the black aces if you will they were down there they had their Stanley Cup t-shirts on ready to come on the ice and celebrate with all you guys who were in the game and I guess earlier that day, they had had what they called the Slug Cup. And they went out and played their own game for the Slug Cup. And Wendell Young carried the, well, I don't know what it was, but he carried it off the ice. And so you talk about, uh, you know, uh, a great group of guys that you mentioned, Gilly. I mean, you had this support staff of people that played a huge role in the, in the feeling of that team, in my opinion just being around and looking back on it now, I, I can see why you would say that about that group. 
because there was something special about even the guys that weren't playing seemed like they were important, you know? I mean, we had guys that were good players that, that didn't play and accepted their role and came out and did their job. I look at, again, a guy like Barry Peterson, the great player in the league and accepted his role there. And we just, uh, we had a special group of guys for sure. All right, guys. You know, when I talk to you guys, it just reminds me of how important players like you are to winning a championship. You know, I always say that the team that wins the cup always has the best role players. And you three guys are perfect examples of that. I mean, I, I honestly think there's no way the Penguins win the cup without you guys. That's just how I look at it. It's like a puzzle. You take one little piece of that puzzle out, you don't have a complete puzzle anymore. So, you know, just want to tell you, for all the great memories you gave me and all the people in Pittsburgh, Penguins fans, thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. And, uh, you know, I have a feeling we're going to see you guys in Pittsburgh uh, next year around this time. We're all going to be celebrating again the 30-year anniversary of the 1991 Cup. Thanks a lot, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, guys. See you later. Thanks, guys. Stay safe.